Welcome, everyone. Hello. Uh, I appreciate you all attending and uh, uh, today's webinar. It's titled The Devil is in the Details, a Thorough Examination of the Need for Clarification and Specification. This is very needed. This is great. I'm Jim Olson with the National Tile Contractors Association, and I want to welcome you and also thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to attend today's webinar sponsored by Noble Company. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to remind you that during the webinar, you'll be muted. Please use the questions area on your computer to type in your questions. We will answer your questions at the end of this presentation. I also want to make note right now that um, if you go to your control panel, you'll notice there's some handouts. There's five handouts for you. And one of those handouts, just so you know, if you're looking for a CEU, there's a handout for CEUs and what to fill out and how to get that get that in your hands so look for that also if the audio on your computer is poor call the number on the invite to this webinar and listen on your phone all of our webinars are available to watch at any time on the NTCA YouTube channel shortly after the webinars are presented this will give you easy access to watch and or share all current and past programs at your convenience. And I want you to know there's 10 years of webinars on there so uh, there's lots to look at and review. All right, I'm very excited to introduce today's speaker, Dean Moylanen. He is a Division IX waterproofing crack isolation and permeation specialist who advises, who advises on some of the most demanding and prestigious jobs and projects in the United States. As a 35-year veteran of the tile industry, Dean's relationships with architects, builders, and owners allow him access to some of the most challenging and compelling design issues in the industry. Dean's ex um, an extensive career on job sites gives him a real world perspective. He has uh, seen firsthand success and failures relating to product selection, installation issues, and sequencing challenges. Welcome, I really appreciate it, Dean. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the NTCA, National Tile Contractors Association, a wonderful organization. Uh, we love supporting all of their endeavors and efforts. And uh, <clears throat> I especially enjoy these opportunities to roll out these webinars. So uh, whether you're an architect, specification writer, uh, distributor, or sales rep, contractor, welcome. And I hope we can have a, an enjoyable hour together. Uh, I must tell you this is a great looking crowd um everyone looks well rested well fed ready to go here um a couple things here a little bit of uh minor housekeeping uh the title of this pro of this presentation i want to make sure that uh you know i don't overstep my boundaries you know like many manufacturer reps trusted advisors consultants to architects and spec writers um we often have very deep and granular knowledge about a very small window of uh, the overall project needs and wants. But uh, so the title, The Quest for Specification Clarity, uh, by no means do I paint myself as an expert into every nook and cranny of writing specifications. But what I wanted to do was just point to some examples. By the way, this is a copyrighted presentation, so don't try to steal it, okay? Um, but what I want to do is uh, use these real life examples as ways of pointing out how I think in different parts of the specification process and different parts of the project, uh, there's probably uh, an opportunity to get a little more granular and detailed with what, what is needed uh, on the part of the, of the owner and the architect and designer and of course how it's supposed to be installed by the contractor. Um, if you want to uh, get your phone out and hit this QR code. There's all kinds of great information you can pull off of uh, doing that that is relevant to this presentation, okay? Uh, again, uh, some background about uh, Noble Company and uh, who uh, we work with uh, across this country. Uh, the owners of Noble Company are Federal Process. Uh, they have been around since 1915, family-owned, uh, a wonderful organization. They have an umbrella of uh, businesses that they manage and operate, and we're one of them, and they have been very supportive in the 10 years that they've owned us. Uh, just, they really have done a lot to ensure the growth of Noble Company, and Noble Company, around since 1946, our humble, we're based in Spring Lake, Michigan. Our, uh, our 
plants or manufacturing plants for our sheep membranes is in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, but our humble claim to fame was we uh, pioneered the concept of sheet membranes for waterproofing for ceramic tile and natural stone in wet areas. Uh, before us, there was hot mop, there was lead, there was copper. And we had this wacky idea of why don't you try using a, a chlorinated polyethylene sheet membrane for waterproofing inside your showers and the rest is history, as they say. This is an approved AIA uh, presentation, meets all those guidelines, okay? And uh, we try to get the IDCEC approval in time for this presentation. This is a new presentation. I uh, just didn't get that done in time, but that will be in the future part of the uh, educational accreditation process. Uh, I don't usually read off the slides, but in this particular case, I want to try to do a little bit of that. You know, the quest for transparency and specifications and execution in the field is a, a never-ending journey uh you know there's an ultimate goal we're all trying to get to uh gee we're going to convey what we want so clearly and so succinctly that the contractor is going to put it in just the way we want and everyone's going to be happy okay that's called construction heaven um and the means and methods of construction they're also ever changing ever evolving and I know one of the challenges I think we all face in this industry is whether you're an architect, specification writer, a distributor, a sales rep, a contractor, staying on top of that information. And, uh, you know, the demands of owners, it's no secret that uh, with these new technological changes and leaps and bounds sometimes and the time it can take to execute in the field, the owners just seem to want their projects done on a tighter and tighter timeline basis. And so it's no surprise, you know, that granularity and precision and specifications really translates to uh, hopefully better execution in the field. And we're going to show you some examples of that today that maybe can apply directly to your own specifications in these areas now, but uh, maybe embrace this concept on a wider uh, scale for other parts of your specification process. Um, we're going to use some real life examples from Division 9, 09300, okay? And uh, we'll look at a couple of ANSI and ASTM standards and protocols as examples of how perhaps that, that language can be tightened up in a specification. We'll review some actual case studies, and I'm going to refer to some specifications that are uh, have been pulled from projects that are actively in the field right now. And so at the end of the presentation, um, hopefully we've sort of opened our eye, all opened our eyes a little bit more to, okay, gee, we are conveying our need and our wants and our desire and our execution, but is there a way that we can perhaps get to that next level, that next depth of granularity and precision to avoid sometimes the problems that can occur when uh, we, we don't have that granularity and, and that clarity, okay? So we're gonna jump right in here. Um, case study number one, the, uh, the vaunted and famous slash infamous ANSI A118.12, uh, many of you may know the SANSI standard, by the way. I do kind of pull some little demos and props up as I go. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this, this is the ANSI standard manual. Uh, great reference tool uh, for with regard to the installation of ceramic tile. Uh, if you don't have this manual, let me know at the end of the presentation. We'll find a way to get you one. But um, what happens is, ANSI A118.12 is relevant to crack isolation, okay? But uh, more importantly, it's not just crack isolation, it's waterproofing and or crack isolation, joint bridging. Um, some of the specifications, many of the specifications I see online oftentimes will kind of merge that description, waterproofing slash crack isolation. And in other instances, they separate it out. But nonetheless, there is a standard for performance. You're trying to, whether it's waterproofing and or crack isolation, you want that membrane to be able to withstand movement because movement is the enemy of a, a, a successful tile or stone installation. If you're in a shower pan, if you're in a wet area and your membrane can handle movement, you're gonna have a leak and maybe some cracked tile as well. If you're in a lobby of a beautiful hotel or automobile showroom with large format polished porcelain or natural stone, if your crack isolation membrane cannot withstand the movement of saw cut joints, coal joints, you're going to have cracked tile. Um, there's a way you can get granular in your specifications to reflect the end result you want. Uh, this is some language pulled right from the ANSI standard. 
manual, okay? And you'll see it talks about a standard performance. You know, that's a 16th of an inch. Uh, high performance is eighth of an inch. And I realize we're talking about you've got a tile or stone layup, you've got a substrate, you've got a membrane, you have a bonding agent, and they open up that detail to represent movement. And they note when the grout and or tile or stone cracks is damaged by that movement. They repeat the test over and over again. They come to an average performance metric. Uh, 16th of an inch is standard. High performance is eighth of an inch. And if you think about it, having a whole assembly move an eighth of an inch without any damage to the grout and or tile or stone is, is pretty significant. Now, when I'm in the field, when I'm doing presentations and I talk to architects and contractors, I ask them, do you think there might be more than a 16th of an inch of movement in a typical shower pan? And if you think about it, where the shower pan meets the wall, where the shower pan ties into the, 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 the clamping ring drain or linear drain, those are areas that experience constant ongoing movement. And maybe at a very modest, small scale, but over time, if your membrane can't withstand that movement, you're going to have a problem. Of course, uh, whether you're inside or outside, your movement joints work hand in hand with your crack isolation membranes to ensure you don't have damaged final installations. Some of you have probably seen this slide before, but it's it's kind of a classic. You know, uh, you have a, a forensic expert with an infrared camera, and I've mentioned this before. For you technological geeks and freaks and nerds, you can now get an attachment to your iPhone for less than $500 that will turn your iPhone into an infrared camera. How good do these work? How well do they work? Well, there are some representatives who handle uh, floor warming products, uh, and they're able to, with this thermal imaging camera, it's under $500 that you attach to your iPhone, you're able to detect the cold so spots and hot spots on a floor. So just a little additional knowledge there. But here you see on the back, on the slides to the left, on the back side of that wall, you have a shower pan. And that shower pan has blown out where the pan meets the wall. Why? Because the movement that occurred there was greater than the membrane, the waterproof membrane, which should have some crack isolation performance characteristics. It couldn't handle that movement, okay? And or maybe that membrane was installed incorrectly, which contributed to that failure. But um there's a way that you can help minimize that. Uh, of course, here we see a, a fluid applied uh, waterproof membrane. And by the way, I think we all know there are fluid applied waterproof membranes and crack isolate membranes. There are sheet membranes. In fact, uh, let me grab for a couple samples here. I'm going to show you, this is an example of a liquid membrane, okay? This is an example of a sheet membrane, all right? This could be a sock cut joint, could be a cold joint, uh, could be where the shower pan meets the wall, that plane transfer. But there's a basic a basic rule of thumb. When it comes to ANSI A118.12 and standard or high performance, most liquid membranes will not meet. In fact, I haven't seen one liquid membrane out there that meets the high performance metric, eighth of an inch, of ANSI A118.12. That does not mean liquid membranes are less than or inferior. All it means is there is a good, better, best in any realm of products. And for the most part, liquid fluid applied membranes will not get to ANSI A118.12. Now, some of these products that are fluid applied, require a fabric be used at a transition like this from the shower pan to the wall, and some don't. But as you can see, the challenge when you use a fluid membrane, they've been around for decades, and they've been around decades and used successfully. You see where that floor is meeting the wall? Do you see that little void there? You better really make sure, even with the fabric and tape, you better really make sure that that, that transition is well coated but without fabric, your challenge is increased, okay? Because that's where this detail is gonna fail, all right? So what do you do? Well, um, you have NCA 18.12, all right? It is, uh, has a high performance, has a standard performance metric. 
you need to call out for high perfor performance in your references, in your general information, okay? And uh, let, me go back, let me go back here one slide, all right? Bear with me. By doing so, by calling out for high performance under those specifications, you're 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 not leaving it to uh, you're not leaving it to the contractor's own preferences. They may not be aware. They qu quite frankly may not be aware that there that option even exists. Okay. All right. Case study number two. ASTM. <laughs> uh, I've got a little icon here. I got to move so I can read this. ASTM D5957 98. Okay. This is for flood testing. Okay. And uh, I will tell you that in the real world of construction, uh, flood testing, um, it's not always obvious that it should be done in each and every instance where you have a wet area. That you're trying to make waterproof. It might be a typical shower pan. It could be a back of the house food prep kitchen. A uh, variety of situations and applications where you're going to have a large amount or a small, modest shower pan that needs to be flood tested. But irregardless, it has to have it has to have 24 hours, two inches in that shower pan okay here you're seeing a back of the house food prep uh kitchen about three thousand square feet total uh, the largest the single largest uh flood test i've ever seen is sixteen thousand square feet uh it was at the aria hotel and casino and this was mind-boggling to behold because you had to go down corridors you went down hallways uh there were temporary dams that had to be created to make that flood test effective. Now here you're seeing, they got their tape measure out. It might be two inches, I'm not sure. Might be two inches, but nonetheless, 24 hours and nothing less. Here are some of the things I've heard suggested that you don't want to be a party to. And you notice that blue area around the drain? Uh, well, what typically happens is, this is one way you make sure that that wet area is watertight. You've got a little inflatable, we'll call it a little inflatable ball or gasket, okay? And you're going to attach that to your hand pump. And what's going to happen is, whether it's one shower or whether it's a uh, hundred showers, they're going to they're going to fill up this little ball, all right, until it's totally swollen and water cannot get down that drain assembly, all right? then you're going to fill that shower pan or that back of the house food prep kitchen or whatever you have that you're waterproofing at two inches for 24 hours. Now, I've heard comments like, well, we're just going to flood test around the drain. Because that's the most critical area. Well, no, not really. Uh, a lot of failures, unfortunately, happen when they do happen. They can happen on the inside corners of the shower or the or, of your of your waterproof assembly. Could be a back of the house food prep area. Those inside corners oftentimes can leak uh, where it meets the curb. If you've got a shower curb, sometimes leaks can occur there. So uh, you have to water, you have to flood test the entire wet area. Uh, I've heard suggestions like, well, we're going to do it for five hours, one hour, 10 hours, whatever. No. Unfortunately, I've seen, I've seen flood tests fail at, at the 23rd hour. Okay. And uh, this may seem obvious, but, and what's a concern to me here, they already have the ceramic tile installed. Now, I don't, you don't wanna wait to do your flood test until your final stone or ceramic tile or mosaic, whatever you have in that shower pan, you don't wanna wait until it's installed to flood test because of, heaven forbid there's a failure, it's already gonna be kind of expensive to pull up that, waterproof shower pan and redo it, but to have to pull up the finished assembly, uh, please don't do that, okay? So make sure, uh, under your references, for your specifications from the very start, 
make sure you reference ASTM D5957-98, okay? Very important, all right? And do not accept anything less than 24 hours as the time you're gonna spend to flood test that area. Of course, one of the big challenges once the flood testing is done is keeping that, that flood tested area safe and secure uh, from construction elements, from workers, from various flotsam and jetsam. I mean, you can, I want you to look at this photo closely. They've just pulled the plug. The water is still kind of sitting on top of the membrane and already there's a pallet. Now, I don't know about you, but I've seen plenty of pallets with nail heads and exposed nails uh, uh, jutting out of the pallet. Uh, Looks like there's some form boards or protection board that maybe someone was gonna put on that, on that wet area, but haven't, hasn't done so yet. So, uh, and if that's not bad enough, take a look at this. Another flood tested wet area that's turned into, gosh, a, 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 a trash collection center. Uh, there's a drilling on the floor. Uh, there's buckets, there's boxes of various attachments and screws. Not to mention, look at the footprints, folks. Now, you know and I know, if you're on a construction site long enough, you're gonna get things on the bottom of your boot. You're gonna have a, a nail, a screw. You're walking across this wet area, it's already been flood tested. It doesn't take much to damage a waterproof membrane. So it's very critical. Waterproofing surfaces are not wearing surfaces, okay? Now, prefabricated pans and trays, they have really taken on um, an ever increasing larger percentage of typical shower pan waterproofing, okay? It's an emerging market. There's uh, the majority, let me, I'll just pull a, I've got a couple samples out here. The majority of the products out there have an EPS, expanded polystyrene, or XPX, extruded polystyrene, component that forms the majority of the sloped shower pan product, okay? Now, Different manufacturers will approach the, the waterproof surface in a variety of different ways, shapes, and fashions, okay? But know this, the PSI for EPS is about 45 or 50 pounds, all right? Um, so if you're using one by one, if you're using two by two or penny rounds, oftentimes there are some requirements for use of an epoxy setting product, sometimes an epoxy grout as well to increase the rigidity and strength of that installation because the PES is kind of low on foam. A variety of manufacturers use uh, a variety of products. This is a honeycomb matrix. Uh, some will use fiberglass with a cementitious coating, but the end result is you want to increase the PSI and strength of the bonding surface. In this instance, the, bond, the PSI is about 235, which means you could use one by one, two by two, penny round. You're not gonna be required to use any type of special uh, adhesive or epoxy setting product. Uh, and you know, as far as epoxy adhesives go, they're wonderfully strong and robust bonding agents, but realize for some people, they can develop an epoxy sensitivity, which means when they're exposed to epoxy resins in a closed environment, like a shower, uh, they can have inflammation of their nasal passages, uh, their lungs, uh, they can develop blistering on their skin. So, you know, if you don't have to use epoxy, it's uh, might be overall a more healthy environment for your setters, okay? Now, let's look at um, this little quick video here. Uh, these are some, a variety of popular current prefabricated shower pans and trays. And what we're showing you is there's a test out there called IATMO PS106. And people try to incorporate, they're trying to create a Nancy standard for these prefabricated shower pans. And part of that standard is you drop a steel ball, two pounds, three feet, and any kind of deformation and damage uh, to the substrate is considered a fail. Because you can see what happens here if that dent, if that indentation is not addressed completely and 
they put the they go ahead and put the tile and stone on and they now the shower is being used well dead skin cells and the soap residue and other come off the human body those are all food sources and all these little low-lying dents these craters are going to become little mini petri dishes okay and as you can see um these are all images of current foam pans and trays. Now, that's not to say you can't use these products effectively, but you have to be aware of the limitations here if you're gonna use, uh, now here's an example of a honeycomb composite. Same test is being done. And no damage whatsoever. So, point is if you're going to get involved with these prefabricated pans and trays and in my own humble estimation they just continue to grow in popularity uh, you need to be aware of the limitations and performance variables of each different manufacturer and uh, it, you would not be unwise to include in your specifications a requirement that shows what is the psi you know what what is the overall strength of that prefabricated pan and tray, because that's gonna influence what type of final product you put on top of it, okay? And again, PSI on these foam trays is about 40 to 50 pounds. Uh, when you start putting uh, different types of topical coatings, could be fiberglass, could be a uh, fiberglass and resin, in the case of one manufacturer, could be fiberglass and cementitious coatings. Uh, you can significantly inc increase the PSI, which reduces uh, the concerns about point loading and compression, okay? Here are a variety of options that are out there, just to kind of uh, give you an idea. Some of these prefab pans and trays are going to be injection molded, all right? The image on the top left is an injection molded EPS foam pan or tray with no waterproofing whatsoever. So you still have to waterproof that product, okay? The image to the right is an EPS foam product, but in this case, they've applied a liquid membrane to the foam to pre-waterproof that product, which is a good idea. Now, the only concern you might have is if it's EPS foam, and it's a liquid membrane, and for any case, in any situation where someone dents it or causes a slow, a minor indentation or break in the surface, you could interrupt the continuity of that, of that waterproofing membrane. Uh, the image on the bottom left is a hybrid product. Uh, it's got EPS foam, but a honeycomb matrix on top of the foam that increases the PSI to about 235, all right? The image to the right is an XPS. That's a much denser, uh, more uh, resist, water-resistant foam, extruded polystyrene with an additional fiberglass and cementitious coating on top of it. Now. Also be aware, depending on the manufacturer, some of these companies can make custom size waterproof pans and trays. Some of these manufacturers can pre-waterproof them, some of them can't. So uh, again, in your specification granularity, really important, I think, if nothing else, to be very clear about the, the PSI requirements of that prefab pan and tray. And also be aware if you want custom sizing, not every manufacturer has that option, okay? So what do you do? Well, we kind of just kind of laid it out. You wanna make sure because there's no ANSI or ISO or, or, or ASTM standards for these prefab pads and trays, the one thing you can, you can go to is the PSI rating for that uh, foam product, okay? Okay, uh, this continues to be a rather challenging scenario, um, and that's just good old-fashioned steam. Um, living in Las Vegas, I will tell you that some years ago, before a large project that was in the neighborhood of $11 billion was undertaken, 6,000 rooms, the owners of that property underwent, they actually created their own forensic waterproofing investigative team and what they found out just simple steam people showering and generating steam in their shower in hospitality settings is so pervasive 
that in essence, you have many steam room environments, okay? So if you have a mini steam room environment, the waterproofing membrane you have on the walls has to be pretty much the same level of quality as you would use in a steam room. And so there's a, there's a standard for that, ASTM E96 Procedure E, and the magic number is 0. 0.5, okay? But if you don't, if you don't call out for ASTM E96 Procedure E in your references, or when you're describing the products to be used, making sure that you qualify them as they must meet this metric, then you might wind up with a membrane on the wall that has a number higher than that. Of course, that's what steam looks like on a mirror or in your glass shower doors. Um, what you don't want is your forensic expert to show up on your job site or your home in a hazmat suit and a respirator. Uh, as you can see, uh, upon examination of the substrate behind the ceramic tile, um, I don't believe there was a low permeation, high quality membrane in place to prevent this from happening. Of course, some of you may have seen this image before. Uh, this is, and again, infrared camera. And of course, I think most of you realize that mold is a living organism, creates its own heat source. And so when you have an infrared camera, trained, oops, I moved my box, my, my laptop a little bit there. Uh, so when you, when you put an infrared camera into this sort of inspection of a shower area, the mold that's behind the backer board is gonna become evident because it's gonna throw out a heat signal, okay? And I will tell you uh, in my own travels in Las Vegas and other where, other places, I've seen projects where you pull the backer board back and literally see black mold nestled in those stud wall cavities. And these are in high-end projects that are three or four years old. Okay, so I find it interesting that the article, Hotels, High Rises, Try Proactive Mold Prevention, was written by a legal firm, okay? Um, the one thing you don't want you or your projects tied up in is extensive remediation and litigation because of microbial growth growth in your stud wall cavities, which is just a fancy way of saying mold in the places you don't want it in your shower, okay? Now, I don't have my five gallon water bucket or five gallon jug, but I got my five gallon bucket. Why would I be showing that? I'll tell you why. Um, depending on what type of membrane you use for your walls and depending on its permeation performance, uh, let me give you uh, um, some basic, uh, turn your mind's eye on, think of 10 showers, average 100 square feet per shower on the walls over a week's time, okay? Now let's say if ASTM E96 Procedure E is the number you wanna to get to 0.5 or lower, and by the way, there are membranes in the marketplace that can get down to 0.15, considered almost impermeable. Well, if you have a membrane like that on your shower walls over a week's time, you know, 10 showers, a thousand square feet, you're probably gonna have a little more than two water bottles full of vapor migration into your sub wall cavities, okay? Now, there are some legacy products on the market for waterproofing on the walls. They have numbers of 1.2, 1.5, 2.0. Well, what that means is you can have roughly a gallon, a gallon and a half, two and a half gallons, which is halfway to filling up this five gallon bucket of vapor migration into your subwall cavity. So very critical, you know, when you're writing your references for your waterproofing, and by the way, this is not a proprietary require, uh, specification. There are a variety of products in the market there are some liquids, there are some sheets that can get you to this number, okay? But you wanna make sure that you're referencing ASTM E96 Procedure E in that part of your specifications. Now, if you reference a certain products or manufacturers, make sure those products also are gonna 
reflect that that level of performance. I see more often than I would like where the specification writer has plugged in the correct ANSI standard for crack isolation, high performance. They've plugged in AES TIMI 96 procedure, and then the products are listed and the products don't meet the requirements of that, of that standard, okay? And of course, I'm not saying that putting a low permeation membrane in the walls is gonna solve all of your vapor migration and uh, concerns about uh, you know, microbial growth in stud wall cavities, but it's going to go a long way. And, and heaven forbid, in the event that there are any issues with microbial growth or a mold remediation, the fact that you as an architect and specification writer have put in a high performance, low permeation membrane to guard against that speaks volumes, okay? Now, some of you may have heard, I've heard this, I believe it to be true, that you're going to see a significant increase in the use of hard surfaces, you know, ceramic tile, natural stone, and exterior living environments, whether they're uh, residential, whether they're corporate uh, areas where employees can uh, avail themselves an exterior uh, relaxation zone or a place to have meetings or lunch, or it's hospitality, restaurants, that simply want to expand their own areas of revenue enhancement to the outdoors. The basic, the basic um, premise being put out there is that there's gonna be some significant growth in that area, um, which is great, but it, it points out a problem and a challenge. A lot of uh, contractors, some specification writers who get used to certain systems that work great indoors, will pull those same products outdoors where they just can't hold up to the rigors of that environment, okay? Here's an example of a failure where the thin set that was used to bond the tile on this exterior environment was not rated for exterior environments. And yes, there are thin sets and grouts that are rated for exterior environments and, and some products are not. The same is true with waterproof membranes. There are some waterproof membranes that are uh, designed and can hold up to exterior conditions, some cannot. But to, to further cloud the issue here too, take a look at the trowel, troweling on here. And you know, I think we all know it's either left or right or up or down, but don't do the rainbow arcs. And as you can see, just looking at the residual trowel marks in this failed deck, uh, they're up and down and all around. And that doesn't help because now, even if you had an exterior grade high performance inset, you're probably getting like 45 or 50% coverage. If you can see the trowel marks after you're done installing the tile and stone, that is, that is incorrect and inferior uh, installation of tile and stone. And it would actually be deemed as worthy of a rip and repair because you've got to have 85% plus coverage, all right? Uh, a thin set to tile or stone. And of course, one of the other challenges is there's a lot of great waterproof membranes, sheet and or liquid, that are wonderful for the inside of your shower stall or your back of the house food prep, but you don't want to, like here's the, you know, here's me grabbing some of my samples all over the place. Here we go, oh, here we go. You know, we have, exterior grade plywood, a deck. And someone said, well, you know what, we're gonna just put our favorite liquid membrane we use inside over our exterior grade plywood and we're gonna, we're gonna have a new deck with Tyler Stone. And it's not gonna last very long, folks. Um, I don't think any of you out there would suggest to a client or a friend or even a foe, hey, why don't you put plywood down in your deck and we're gonna put a, a modestly priced interior waterproof membrane, crack iso membrane down, we're gonna bond tile of stone, it's all gonna be good. Um, there are waterproof membranes that will meet the rigors of exterior environments. They have antioxidants, UV inhibitors, uh, they have the, the resiliency and the robust composition to withstand that type of exterior thermal cycling. Um, and it doesn't matter where it's a liquid or sheet, there are liquids and sheets that work great indoors, it will not work at all outdoors. Um, 
Now, I would say when you get to the exterior environment, your choices of available products goes way, way down, but there are a few liquid membranes that will that purport to meet uh, the, the performance requirements of exterior waterproofing crack isolation. Uh, there are a handful of sheet membranes that purport to have that same performance level. So please, you need to really be granular. You know, when you get to the outside of the building, make sure that the product you're specifying meets those requirements, okay? Now, some simple ways of making sure that uh, you don't put the wrong product in the wrong place. And some of this ties into uh, your movement joints. When you, get, when you get outside, your movement joints have to, have, have to happen every eight to 12 feet, okay? On an interior installation, 16 to 24 feet. You have a lot. You have a, a lot more space to put your movement joints into. Really critical if you're going to put movement joints, whether they're interior or exterior. If you use a high-performance crack isolation membrane, you can move those movement joints to the next closest grout joint. You don't have to rip right through your finished tile or stone to accommodate where a cold joint might be occurring, where a socket joint might be occurring. Uh, the use of a high performance crack iso membrane that will give you up to an eighth of inch of movement allows you to transfer those soft joints to the next adjacent grout joint. Of course, got my ANSI standards, I have my tile counts with North America handbook and uh, you know I travel every week across the country with these two handbooks, and they are just wonderful, wonderful tools. Uh, of course, they are recommendations, not requirements, okay? And what that means is, if you run into a product from a manufacturer that has a uh, installation method that differs from the Tile Council North America Handbook, that manufacturer's written instructions will supersede, will supersede, uh, the TCNA handbook, okay? So really important to make that distinction, all right? Okay, so in conclusion, okay, I've said this before, it's an inaccurate statement. Specifications are not boilerplate, okay? Uh, they are organic, living, breathing, ever-changing documents. And, uh, you know, when I speak to specification writers, uh, you know, the one thing that they will tell me, you know, it's great to have all these new apps and all these new different tools to assist in specification writing, but it's not a plug and play type of scenario. Each individual project has their own individual needs, um, different products, you know, waterproof membranes amongst three different manufacturers may have different requirements and may require you to alter your specification to address that particular product's limitations or strengths. Um, I think one of the key, key elements is communication between trusted advisors, manufacturers representatives, uh, technical assistance lines, because the information out there that's available to the architect, the designer, the specification writer is so overwhelming and so ever evolving that without a constant feedback loop between design and manufacturing and construction, uh, we're gonna wind up with these scenarios where, gee, we wanted that high performance crack isolation membrane, but it wasn't noted in the specifications. Or gee, we wanted a, you know, we, we didn't want to use a liquid membrane outside for waterproofing because uh, we weren't happy with the crack isolation performance of that liquid membrane. Or, gee, we've been using this uh, waterproof membrane for years in our showers. We weren't aware that the permeation rate was this high. So this is where it sounds obvious, but it's still a challenge. The communication between people making the products and the people specifying and using them has to be ongoing and open. Of course, part of, part of the, the key foundation to successful Installation of tile stone is qualified labor, and you know Noble Company is a big pro proponent of uh, 
really bringing that message. Uh, when we do these presentations nationwide every week, regardless of whether for if they're architects, contractors, distributors, you know, we're always promoting qualified labor. It's just such a key part of ensuring the longevity of our industry. And of, it's part it's a part of mass respect, writing their language. And uh, I will tell you that in my travels, I've seen where on certain projects, certain contractors, um, they told the owner, they told the general contractor, uh, yeah, we are we're qualified labor, we meet these requirements. And it was discovered that indeed they did not meet these requirements and they were removed from the project. Now, I'm not gonna say it happens every day, but the point is, I believe this area of, of qualified labor and demands for a certain level of skill, I think that I think that that's getting much more uh, much more uh, baked in to the specifications and much more baked into the requirements of the owner and the general contractors out there. So by by being proactive, by uh, sourcing one of these various institutions to help you increase you your skill set your company's skill set the skill set of your employees uh, what you're doing is obviously elevating uh, skills and the uh, the marketability of your company but you're also helping to ensure look we want all these projects that are specifying tile and stone we want them to be successfully installed so we can all for years to come be a part of a very vibrant dynamic growing industry in which People are happy with the end results of what's going on. And here are some of the, the areas that we think are covered, large format tile, membranes, um, mud work. Uh, these are just uh, some of the major areas. And I will also tell you that it's not an easy, it's not an easy test, it's not an easy protocol to pass. Um, we had a recent international event uh, in the, back in the eastern part of the country. And I believe about half of the people who took this final certification were able to pass. It's not just multiple choice or an essay question. It is a lot of very demanding installation in a very compressed amount of time. So I uh, know that the people who have risen to this challenge and passed these tests are truly qualified labor. One more look at some of the uh, email addresses of these organizations. And I am going to uh, draw to a close my portion of the presentation. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time to go over some of these key examples, I believe, of how we can uh, get a little more granular with our specifications. And uh, you need to get a hold of me. You've got my cell phone number. You have my email address. And once again, thank you for taking the time to meet with me today. Thanks, Dean. Um, I want to thank you for working hard with us to get these qualified labor language into specifications and uh, spec link and uh, all the different uh, avenues. It means a lot. Thank you. We do have some questions today. You had a, a, a beautiful presentation with a lot of information, so I expected some questions here. Um, the first one that we have is what frequency of flood testing do you recommend for hotels, multifamily, et cetera? all showers or a certain percentage randomly selected? That's a great question, Jim. And I'll tell you, I won't mention the, the city or the, uh, the project, but there was some time ago, um, someone who was into statistics and analysis and probability, and that all makes sense on a certain level, but someone came up with the idea of, well, we're gonna test out of every 10 showers installed, we're gonna test like three or four. And, we develop a baseline of performance based on that, and uh, that didn't work out so well. You, it's you have to you have to flood test each and every shower stall. You know, I've been a part of projects that were six thousand. Imagine Las Vegas, six thousand rooms with six thousand, well, probably more than six thousand showers because some of these rooms had more than one shower. But each and every shower wet area had to be flood tested for twenty four hours, two inches, and again. The Aria Hotel back at the house food prep, 16,000 square feet. It, I used to have the video of this. I really, I weep when I think I lost this video, but it was it was mind boggling to see that large of a service area flood tested successfully. So yeah, it's, it's simply has to be done. I agree, every single one of them. 
Yep. The one you miss is the one that's going to fail. You got it. You got right. it. Um, Alice is asking, is there a, a more detailed document or link available for case study number four? She'd like to uh, just, just uh, examine it in more detail if possible. Uh, you know, I'll tell you what, let me, uh, I, I will, um, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a valid request. And um, let me do this um, upon the conclusion of this presentation. I'll go back and see if I can get a little more um, validation or documentation to substantiate uh, some of the uh, things that were gone over in that particular example. Be happy to do that. So Alice and everyone else out there, Tomorrow you'll receive a thank you email from me, just thanking you to come. Just reply to that, that you'd uh, like to get that information. I'll make sure Dean gets it and make sure that uh, whatever he finds, he'll have that for you. Thank you, appreciate it. All right, let's see here. Well, one of the uh, MTCA trainers, our training director said terrific information and uh, interesting presentation, so that's good. Um, here's one, in, re in regard to actual Specification, do you recommend that the spec writer simply references the applicable anti ASTM PCNA requirement or should it actually be written out and explained, um, codified in specs to ensure that the subcontractors installers are fully aware of the actual workmanship quality that is required? You know, um, you know, I, I've seen, you know, I, I've seen, uh, and again, I, I tread very carefully here because uh, you know I, I spent a lot of time with spec writers and I'm amazed at the level of of detail that they're able to uh, source for their for their activities. You know, and I've seen sometimes a very broad statement like you know um, installation must meet all current industry standards and ANSI and ASTM standards. You know, and that that sort of blanket statement, I guess, on, on one level makes it clearer to the subcontractor general that we expect this to be done. But I think that um, going a step further, so, you know, granted, you're saying we want all of our work to meet these ANSI, whatever relevant ANSI and AFTM standards are needed. But, you know, for crack isolation, I think that um, because I just have seen so many failures where um, there wasn't the, the, the differentiation between standard performance and high performance was not spelled out or if it was spelled out it was you know they called for high performance but they didn't the products they listed didn't meet high performance and so now you're you know you're on a job inspection or you're wondering well gee why did this not go the way we wanted it to well uh i think taking the extra step to be very very precise okay yes i we want you to meet all astm standards relevant to this project and this installation but when it comes to the waterproofing on the walls we want to make sure you're doing ast referencing and using and employing and installing astm e96 procedure e period that way there's 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 no gray area because i don't think a lot of contractors i think a lot of folks don't realize that that membrane they're putting on the wall uh, may not be may not get them to where they want to go with regard to vapor migration. Great. Real quickly, everybody, before a lot of people leave a little bit early here before we answer all the questions, please note uh, Dean's at email address and phone number are on here. Jot it down in case you would like to get a hold of them. I'll tell you right now, Don will, uh, Dean will be happy to. Uh, uh, reply to you and uh, communicate for sure, definitely. It looks like we have one more here. Wait, we've got a couple more. Here we go. In regard to, uh, uh, nope, oh, excuse me, I just read that one. Here we go. Are you aware of updated spec writing classes are being taught to the incoming architects, designers, and P PEs, PMs coming out of school today? Well, yeah, I, you know, Ed, that's another another great question, and and, and that's sort of like a um, I'm sort of outside the fishbowl looking in. Um, you know, I just got done with um, you know groups like uh, CSI, groups like Skip. Um, you know, they their their part of their existence is is based on they're constantly ex exposing their membership to uh, 
whatever new and relevant scenarios are, are out there uh, for them in the field that they need to be aware of. Now, on a um, academic, uh, you know, a, a, a critical path uh, as part of your architectural degree or, or a project management degree, um, I can't tell you, I, I, I'm not sure uh, to what extent uh, these types of programs might be uh, uh, drilling down to make sure that uh, a specification writer uh, is going to have the, the basic tools in their tool bag. Uh, but I, I based, based on a manufacturer's technical trusted advisor relationship with architects and spec writers, um, I see a lot of ongoing training and enriching and enlarging of the knowledge base of the spec writers that are out there. I guess that's the best way I can put it right now. All right. Well, Dean, another great program. Attendees, thank you. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, again, you'll get a thank you email from me, and uh, I want to make sure you understand. Um, don't hesitate to ask a question. Just respond to the email. And uh, I'll make sure Dean gets it, and uh, we'll answer all your questions, and I'll be bombarding Dean with a bunch of questions, maybe. So we'll see here. So, Dean, thank you. Attendees, thank you again for taking so much time of your day to be here. All right. Bye now, everyone. Thank you thank very you. much. Have a great day. All right. You too, Dean. Bye-bye.